to work on what we're doing today. First of all, uh, you should have the attachment, the document uh, for the new Imperialism audio presentation part one it's for the PowerPoint. It's going to go right with the slides that I've got on the screen here uh, that we are going to cover. I am not worried about you submitting it. I just want you to be able to take notes on what I'm talking about. I will identify when I'm addressing a question when I'm going through the slides. So stay with me on there. If you need to pause it and, and catch up, that's fine. Uh, but I've got 15 minutes. I'm going to try and do my best job of covering this, giving you some detail with it uh, as we go through. Now, uh, the topic, as you can see here on the first slide here, is the new imperialism. So I'll, what makes it new? Well, well, we'll talk about that. It definitely has some ties to what you previously covered in the Industrial Revolution with Mr. Hart. Uh, with all the machinery, the factories, the new materials, uh, the new inventions, well, there had to be something running through these machines. And these countries that developed into industrial powers uh, used this strength, this new power that they had to kind of flex their muscles throughout the world uh, throughout the 1800s. And one of the main reasons they did it, as we're going to talk about, was to get raw materials to run through these new machines that they were using and to ultimately make money in the capitalist system. So let's get through this. We're going to talk about this going through. I'm going to jump to the first slides. The first thing that we've got here is, you know, what is the definition of imperialism? Well, I think a lot of us probably have a pretty good idea of what it means to be an empire. Uh, but what I'm looking for, when we really talk about imperialism, yeah, it's, it's collecting countries. Uh, but it's really, when we write this down for number one, uh, where it says, what is the definition? It's the domination by one country of political, economic, or cultural life of another country or region. Let me repeat that one more time. The domination by one country of political, economic, or cultural life of another country or region. Now, most times this is done by military means, but it can be done by economic means, meaning like it's like Walmart coming in and flooding the market against some little mom and pop grocery store and they can't compete. That has happened too. So there's a couple ways it can be done. Uh, usually it's by military. The second question we have here is we're looking at when did the period that we call new imperialism actually take place? And we, we talk about the first imperial movement that took place between the years 1500 and 1800. That's your Columbus, your Cortez, your Pizarro, uh, all the French explorers in Canada, uh, the Americas, the New World. All that stuff that was taking place between 1500 and 1800. Uh, and, you know, the big thing there was that there was a lot of people actually at that time that were trying to get new territory, start new governments, uh, govern this territory, just like the Puritans when we talk about in the Americas. You know, they came for religious freedom. They wanted to start their own place where they could live by their own values and govern their territory. And they always wanted to make money. That's always a key in there is making money. Now, how is that different between the new imperialism movement? So this new imperialism movement for number two started in the 1800s, early 1800s, and carried up into the 1900s, if you want to be specific, into 1914. And once again, they're out to make money. But one thing that was different in the second period was that they actually tried to avoid governing. They tried to stay out of, of the big affairs and try to, in some cases, let these people, as long as they were loyal, basically run their own governments, and they just wanted to make the money and stay out of it. If they could, it didn't work out that way. Now, there are some clear advantages that the Western world had at this point in time in history. Uh, with industrialization, you know, we're looking at... Number three, what advantages did the Western world have over other parts of the world it was seeking to control? Well, they had more modern ec economies. Their, or, their governments were much better organized, okay, well-structured. Okay, Another one, big one here. With all the new tech, they had better militaries. In particular, we didn't have air forces back then, uh, but the navies and the guns they were using with interchangeable parts, things like that. We're going to start getting into machine guns later on, too, as well. Uh, those are going to play a huge factor against people that don't have that type of equipment. And then another one uh, down here at the bottom is just overall superior technology. 
And one that people miss a little bit is medicine. For instance, quinine was for malaria. It was a pill that people could take. And, you know, malaria, as we know, is spread from mosquitoes even to some parts of the world today. If you have to go there, you have to get a malaria shot, uh, inoculation. Uh, Europeans had never really gone to Central Africa and some of these jungle regions. Uh, they had stayed around the coast during the slave trade. But for the first time with some of this new medical technology, it allowed them to actually go into the interior of places like Africa and, and discover and explore new things. So that was also an important advantage that Europeans and in particular Westerners had over the areas that they were conquering. So that should be number three. Now, moving on. Uh, what were the motives? Well, for number four, the main motives of imperial nations during the new imperial era. Number one, they needed industrial needs. They had natural resources and raw materials. Once again, they needed natural resources, the raw materials that they were running through their machines. They put through these resources and they put them through the machines. And when it came out, they were products. And they turn around and sell those products and make big money off it. Now, we're going to get into rubber, palm oil, oil, other things as well. You know, we're going to be looking at cotton as well, Egypt, India, and, you know, even the southern part of the United States. Huge cotton, uh, basically, uh, production coming out of there uh, that was usually in some kinds sent to Britain to run through their textile mills. Uh, another thing, another second thing here, they wanted new markets, more people to sell to. Okay, economic interest in new markets. If you can sell more to more places, you're going to make more money. Third thing, Europe was bursting at the seams of population. With the agricultural revolution, there just wasn't enough land. The enclosure movement, all that took place. There was just not a lot of places for people to go in Europe. So a lot of people left. They migrated. Many of them went to the United States. But other people saw other chances in the colonies and these new imperial states that they had been set up. Another factor is military interests, okay? Naval bases, you wanted to have influence throughout the world. For instance, look at the United States, uh, Hawaii, the Philippines. These were all areas where the United States set up naval bases and places where they could actually fuel their trading sh uh, ships uh, across the world, okay? So military interests to kind of have influence all over the world. If something happened, you were involved. And then the last thing is, it's prestige. It's it's power. It's, hey, you know, I'm someone that's part of an important club if I have colonies. If you wanted to be considered one of the big dogs as far as colonies, or I'm sorry, as far as important countries, and imperial countries, you needed to have colonies. It was one way to show it off. Okay. All right. Now, side motives. Some other side motives here that we're going to focus on uh, next week. This is going to be the part where I start talking about, yes, there's going to be a lot of racist stuff that took place in these colonies. Uh, the first additional side motive was this humanitarian, which we call social Darwinist goal, where you were working with native people, otherwise known as indigenous people. Because European society, because of industry, had thought, we are the new way, it's our duty and responsibility to bless the rest of the world with our civilization. And if someone was living the way he had been living 200, 300 years ago, they considered that savage, uncivilized, and they had a duty to bring those people to the new way of thinking. Two, people were interested in adventure and intrigue. Okay, To be able to go to Africa, for example, and go into the interior and see all these, these animals, the elephants, the rhinos, all this stuff. It was a big deal, and it was something exciting for people to do. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of places in the world that you could still explore that were new. So, like, for example, safaris were a big deal to be, go game hunting. And this is the same thing that happened in the Americas with the buffalo when people got out west. You know, they went and shot these things for sport. And we know what they did to the buffalo in the west. Uh, in a lot of cases, we're still dealing with some of the ramifications of this even in Africa today. And then the other thing, too, another side motive was if you went to a, uh, an imperial nation or a colony, you, know, you didn't have a lot of economic restrictions. It was minimal. 
Uh, so if you got out of Europe and maybe you didn't have a chance to do something in Europe and you didn't have the influence to do it, you could go to a colony and if you could establish yourself, you could stand to make a ton of money and make a name for yourself where you couldn't back in Europe or other places. So those are three additional side motives. Okay. Now, that's the first page of your worksheet. Let's get to the back side. We got a couple things. Now, this all worked in perfect harmony with the fact that while these new imperial empires were on the rise, which included most of Europe, Great Britain, France, Belgium, Italy, Germany, and Russia, the United States, and yes, there was one Asian imperial nation that was on the rise between 1800 and 1900, and that was Japan. And we'll talk about Japan specifically in some of our readings that we get to later. But Japan was very unique in that they did it on their own without a lot of help. Uh, at the same time, when these were rising, these old civilizations that had been around for years throughout the world and dominated uh, culture, the Ottomans, the Mughals in India, uh, the Qing dynasty in China was falling apart, and then the West African trade states that had been so powerful for years, uh, once the slave trade dies down, uh, there's really not a lot going on in West Africa as well. So these are all on the decline while those European nations I mentioned and the United States and Japan are all on the rise between 1800 and 1900. So make sure you fill out your table with those. Now of all of these imperial powers, it was obvious the most successful was Great Britain. Now we're looking at a political cartoon that shows Great Britain spreading its influence all over with its arms like an octopus uh, with places like Ireland, Egypt, India, Canada, uh, Gibraltar, Borsland, which is technically South Africa, uh, Cape Colony, Malta. Yeah, there's quite a few in here, Jamaica. Uh, so Great Britain, this little, you know, two islands, was able to exert a, a ton of control over the rest of the world. And for 7A, you know, there's a popular slogan that you see up here in the top left. There was a saying that said, the sun never set on the British Empire. And technically it was true because the amount of territory it controlled at any point in time of the day, the sun was shining on one of the territories that they controlled, especially into, even into the 1920s. So the sun never set on the British Empire is the slogan you're looking for, for 7A. Now, getting into the last thing that we're going to cover here today is... Uh, what were some of the different forms of imperial rule? Now, in the old imperial way, uh, and a lot of the uh, previous uh, empires that were before, and, and, that, and the British kind of did things different, most people practiced direct colonial rule, which was you, if you were an imperial country, you sent everything. You sent officials, you sent military, you sent administrators. You controlled everything. Well, you start getting into some of these other groups here, uh, you got indirect colonial rule, where that was a little different. You actually tried to use locals to govern, and you actually educated the children of these locals, especially the rich kids, uh, on how to live in the Western way. And you would hope through that influence that they would be loyal and they would run things for you. So that's the main difference between direct and indirect. Direct, it was Europeans running things. Indirect, it was the locals usually that were loyal to the imperial nation. Uh, you also had protectorates, just like Cuba was once a protectorate of the United States. Basically, the United States had land rights, and the United States pr uh, basically promised Cuba military protection if they were attacked. And then the last one, the most important one here uh, of all these that we're going to cover too later with China, was for number nine, what is a sphere of influence? And that's basically where outside nations... Uh, maybe through a war or some way in a treaty, they end up getting, uh, basically an outside power ends up getting exclusive trade privileges or economic privileges within that country. They get special deals. Okay, uh, And in the case of China, as we're going to talk about, and in Latin America with the United States, uh, Europeans carved spheres of influence in China and the United States carved spheres of influence in Latin America. So these were four types uh, of imperial rule. So with that, uh, that covers this introduction to imperialism. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me. Let me 